All right, you guys. Well, another chapter. We got the alien of the ego today. TK spent a lot of time putting this one together. Did a hell of a job as well. Um, I'm going to let him start breaking into everything and make sure everything's taken care of and we can dive into how we become alienated in our own lives as well. And what does that even mean? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the interesting thing about this one is it is a little bit darker um, and you will see why. <laughs> but uh, I think everybody's going to be able to relate to this one in some type of way um, just based off of our age in here. Cool. So for those who haven't joined before, I just wanted to go back through a few topics just to make sure that it's a refresher for some that have been here, but also to set a baseline to actually get into the conversation. So sorry for those that have heard it like four times now, but the, the psyche, the totality of the human mind, conscious and unconscious. Carl Jung also included in this definition, the overlap and tension between the personal and the collective elements in man. Psychology is the scientific or objective study of the psyche. So a lot of what we'll actually be diving into is this collective elements in man. We're trying to look for these archetypal things, these things that happen in everybody's mind. They're always different experiences, but there's very similar experiences throughout everybody's internal world. And so a lot of what Jung did was dive into those things. And uh, with that being said, we wanted to also define the self. And so the self is within the psyche. It's kind of the overall psyche. It's the ordering and unifying center of the total psyche, conscious and unconscious. So it's not just the ego. It's also these other aspects that you have. You'll hear the term persona, um, anima, animus. You hear those things over time, but essentially the self is all of those things and the ego is within the self. And we'll have a few pictures to kind of represent that. But the ego, represents the conscious mind as it comprises the thoughts, memories, and emotions a person is aware of. Uh, the ego is largely responsible for feelings of identity and continuity, or continuity, <laughs> I messed up on that last couple of times. But the personal and conscious contains temporality, um, forgotten information, as well as repressed memories. And so every single childhood memory, those type of things, are, and uh, all of your experiences throughout your whole life, those are things getting stored within the ego, the things that you're actually aware of. And then over time, you just start to memorize the things that are the most relevant pieces of information that basically back up all your beliefs and worldviews. But uh, the ego is basically where you have light um, within your mind. It's the things that you're actually aware of within yourself. Is there anything you want to add on that? No, sir. And really what we're going to be focusing on here is individuation which is the achievement of self-actualization through a process of integrating the conscious and the unconscious. Sounds fancy. Really what we're looking to do is become an individual though. How do you separate yourself from a society that's told you to be certain things, from parents that have told you to be certain things to actually find out who you are? And a lot of this is a process that you continue to go through your whole life. And so individuation basically is the process of becoming an individual and going through that self-actualization process and you're integrating the conscious and the unconscious. The metaphor that I continue to use for the unconscious is it's this vast ocean, it's abundant. And so you have all these things stemming from the collective man over all of these ages. I mean, ever since he's been conscious that have stacked up over time. And so all those things are within you. So being aware of those things that are archetypal as well as uh, just even your own consciousness, so. It can be as little as, again, we're just becoming ourselves, becoming the best version of ourselves. Why do we have heroes? Um, because we see little things in those heroes that we think we can become. And it's not that we need to become that person that is our hero. I mean, you'll see a lot of people, they'll put media figures out, they'll put public figures out, celebrities. They're like, man, I want to be just like so-and-so. I want to dress just like, I ain't going to name names because that's going to be bad. But I want to be like so-and-so. And instead of uh, becoming their own person and adopting the good quality that so-and-so had, now they try to do everything like that. So now they're getting, oh, well, oh, she had Botox. Let's get Botox now. Oh, she had whatever done to her. So now I got to have her done to her. Or this guy, he did this action. So now I got to take this, that, this action. It's like, no, uh, take the gold from each person and become you. Throw your style in there. This isn't about becoming anybody else or trying to be anybody else. It's becoming our own self. And 
this one, like TK said, it, it gets a little darker sometimes. It's not a sunshine and rainbow journey as we're about to find out here. And so just to throw in a few things from the previous conversation, uh, what we covered was the inflated ego. Um, and essentially what that means is from earliest infancy, no ego or consciousness exists. So that's a very important thing because people essentially within that ocean, you would start to develop a boat over time, which would be your ego, right? Because the ego is within that self, the unconscious. But as a kid, you're basically within a stage where the unconscious is basically living for you. And so all is in the unconscious. The person's not actually aware of the life that they're living to the fullest until things start to not go their way. And so that, that's also tied into infantile grandiosity. Essentially, a mother provides for a kid a lot within the, the earlier stages of their life, and that can kind of set tones for the rest of their lifetime um, of the way they think the world works. But then the real world starts to come along and breaks that worldview, and they start to see life is a little bit harsher um, than they thought, and then that's what starts to bring them into consciousness. Hard things is what gets people to become conscious. And so that's really a lot of what we dove into. That's a high level overview. Anything you want to add to that recap? No, we're about to break into some good stuff today, ladies and yeah. gentlemen. Good. And so this is a uh, part of what I wanted to dive into too, because this is a very important image as we continue to go on. Um, this would be the idea of the ego within the self, right? So this is the way a kid is in early stages of life. And then those hard things start to happen and they start to break away from the self. They start to be, have more awareness more consciousness and life continues to go on and the ego continues to separate from the self. They become more aware of these things that are going on with the unconscious and they dive into the depths of themselves and they really start to bring light to all those things that have been going on, both personal experiences as well as knowing all these myths a little bit more to understand the internal world. And a lot of people, the thing is, they'll go through this process, but they're completely unconscious of what's actually going on in the stages of their life. And so we'll talk about the individuation process. People go through it naturally, but basically Carl Jung was the one to break into it and pointed out that there, these stages happen in people's lives. So if you know the stages that you're going through, you're a lot more likely to be like, okay, well, I know what the next stage is. So you can actually start to set yourself that way. Um, but if you aren't aware of the stages that are going on, you basically stay in one and you're not aware of what comes next. And so this, this also dives into it. I'm just gonna give a brief overview of this, but uh, inflation is what we covered last time. And you're basically in this active state of inflation. You try something crazy, <laughs> something that breaks your worldview, right? And then you get rejected by the world. It wasn't exactly as you viewed the world. And so basically um, you have to become conscious because of all the pain that's going on in life. And this is a lot of what we're talking about today. We talked about Adam and Eve, how they get kicked out of the garden. Um, that wasn't an easy process for them. We have some images to kind of recap that, but you get alienated from the greater self within, and it happens with wounding, uh, dismemberment is another thing, but essentially you get hurt in some type of way and it breaks your unconsciousness and you get focused on what's actually happening right here in the moment. Have you ever seen the Fight Club movie? Uh, he's getting his hand burned by Tyler Durden and he's like, focus on the pain that's happening right here because pain is essentially what makes you conscious. If you haven't gone through pain before, you're very unconscious of the life that's going on around you. That's why working out, that's why uh, just hard things in general, they bring you into the moment. You have to be there. And uh, rather than trying to run from it, facing it is what we're looking to do. Absolutely, and as you face it, the more easy it becomes. I mean, Denby talked about it with sparring. It's a, or even leg day. The longer you don't do leg day, the more you don't wanna do leg day. It's true. But if you just get into it, it's a fat I'm not hitting legs today. The next day, it's like, hey, I can hit legs again today. I'm a monster. I already conquered it. I'm not building up the fear in my head, running a movie in my head of why I need to be terrified of it. Or sparring, it's like, oh, well, what if something happens? Or you get locked in the cage. Well, what if something happens? It's kind of nerve wracking. The longer you don't do it, you run away from fear, the worse the movie becomes that you play in your head of, oh, shit, this is bad. I can't do it. And can't is a swear word here but we are able to face that fear. And as soon as you face that fear and focus on it, it's like, oh, fuck, it wasn't even that bad. It was just, it was exactly what I needed to be on, in, in all honesty. Yeah, so this process continues to repeat itself again and again in the early phases of psychological development, each cycle producing an, in, 
increment of uh, consciousness. Thus, gradually, consciousness is built up. So you'll continue to go through these phases, and then you continue to become more and more conscious. You get hurt in some type of way, and then you get humbled, and then you start to accept the way the world actually is, and then you get inflated again, and then you keep going through that process all of life. But you get better and better each time. So you become more aware of the real world, and your inner world starts to actually be able to um, reflect a lot more of what's going on outside of you. If you go to the gym one time and eat one healthy meal, that doesn't mean you're going to get lean out and get fitter than ever, ever before. It's a continuous process. It's a lifestyle. Uh, self um, internal questioning and psychological questioning in order to grow is a process. A diamond is created through heat and pressure. It doesn't just happen like that. It has to go through a process. Uh, the caterpillar does not just turn into the butterfly. It has to go through the, the, the cocoon to process. So don't be upset today. You're like, man, I got these great tools to be able to get out of the despair that I felt I'm in. And then I get stuck and I can't be there. Like, don't, don't be uh, worried about that. Uh, Garden of Eden. This is just the last of the recap of last time's uh, talk. And go ahead, TK, with the fruit and the serpent. Yeah, this merges perfectly into what we're going to talk about today. Um, so they eat the fruit, right? And fruit is the symbol of consciousness. It is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means it brings awareness of the opposites. Good and evil, chaos and order. There's so many different things, but uh, the specific feature of consciousness, you have to have this duality in order to actually be conscious. And so eating the forbidden fruit marks the transition from the eternal state of unconscious oneness with the self. Basically, you're mindless, animal state, ignorant, um, to a real conscious life and space and time. And then the serpent equaled the gnosis, knowledge or emerging consciousness. And so the serpent's temptation represents the urge to self-realization in man and symbolizes the principle of individuation. So a lot of what we've been talking about. So actually breaking into today, the new stuff, the alienated ego. And so to, to dive into that, this one is a little bit more wordy just because I want to make sure we're having a detailed explanation for these things. But although the, ego, uh, although the ego begins in a state of inflation due to identification with the self, this condition cannot persist. Encounters with reality frustrate inflated expectations and bring about an estrangement between ego and self. This estrangement is symbolized by such images as a fall, an exile, an unhealing wound, a perpetual torture. And so Adam and Eve, they're in there and then they eat from the tree and then they get kicked out and it happens uh, to the point that they, they're now kicked out and they start to see the real world and it starts to reflect the hardness that the real world is and it's very painful. It's not an easy thing to accept, but they've now gone through that same idea that I was talking about. They now see the duality of life. It's not just good, it's also evil. And so now they've been kicked out and uh, they are exiled from paradise. And we're going to break into this deeper, but how many times have we had an experience where we get hurt and we, we just brush it off? We push it to the back of our mind and then we move on with our life. We're moving forward. And then all of a sudden it comes back and you're like, oh, that hurts there again. It's like, fuck, I thought I moved past that. But you didn't move past it because you didn't face it. There was uh, weeds in the garden and they continued to, um, they continued to grow because you turned your head away from the weeds. And now they're going to start overtaking the garden. So you have to be able to understand just like the fear of sparring, of lay there. Oh shit, I don't want to do it. You can't just fucking brush it under the rug. It's gonna resurface whether you like it or not. So it's either deal with it and we're gonna get to this and how, or wait till it comes back up again. Oh, it stabs you again. It's like, just put a bandaid over the problem instead of, hey, let's get the cause and let's cure the cause. Yeah, by, not, by choosing not to look at it, it actually becomes an even bigger problem and it starts to control you in the back behind the stage, if you will. But yeah, so I just wanted to show this image once again. You can see they were in this beautiful paradise <laughs> and then they, uh, they get kicked out. You can see the light radiating once again from where it was once beautiful, but now they're actually going into the real world. Um, to point it out again, there's a, a terrible volcano in the background. All these trees are decaying, but you can see that this reflects more of the real world. 
this is a state that you're in when you're in a kid, but then you start to see life as it is. It's a little bit darker than you thought. And now they're going to face that. So despair and violence. In the state of alienation, the ego is not only disidentified from the self, which is desirable, but it is also disconnected from it, which is most undesirable. So basically, uh, they, they're separated from the God image, and that's not a good thing because then life starts to feel meaningless. And so connection between the ego and the self gives foundation, structure, and security to the ego. It also provides energy, interest, meaning, and purpose. So when you're connected to that God image or uh, you know, the, just the greater self, however you want to phrase it, your greater personality within, um, you actually feel energy, interest, meaning, and purpose when you are not connected to that thing. That's when the connection is broken. The result is emptiness, despair, meaninglessness, in extreme cases, psychosis, or suicide. It's when somebody's in that nihilistic state where it's just like, why do anything? What's the meaning to anything? And you know, people can often get into this type of state, whether it's a relationship that ends or somebody passes away in their life, that something hard comes down their path. And then they start to question life as a whole. Why me? Why did this happen? And uh, they have that emptiness. It's basically the exact opposite of how you would feel if you were connected to the greater self, which is energy, interest, meaning, and purpose. And what, what's, here's just another way of putting that the same thing. So look at this here. It says, in the state of alienation, the ego is not only disidentified from the self. So tapping into the animal body, understanding we have two bodies. We have the animal body, the flesh, and we have the spirit body. Understanding that we have both is desirable, okay? But if, oh, here it is. If it's completely disconnected, it is undesirable. If I'm only living through my animal body, it's where's the next girl? Where's the next adrenaline rush? Where's the next distraction? Where's the next fulfillment? Where is that next entertainment right i'm continually searching i'm never fulfilled i'm never going to be um completely full Denby always says this my belly is warm once he's all done eating he's ready to go his belly is warm that's like that's what we've got to get to is our belly has to be warm but we have to understand we're twofold we're twofold creatures and being able to marry the two is where the magic happens if it's completely disconnected we're living in one or the other we're either completely sucked in the spirit and we're living in a dream world or we're completely sucked in the animal and we forget that we're bouncing back and forth. Just like that picture of the ego. You're going to continue to go through the processes like a pendulum. You, you know, the pendulum continuing to swing back and forth. It's that same thing. Um, as soon as you can marry the two, you get to choose where you're at. You get to be able to bounce back and forth through them. It's almost teleportation. I mean, this is quantum physics type, type stuff, like for real at a simple, simple level. Yeah, so here's a few pictures that kind of symbolize this idea of alienation. So you have an idea of what it looks like, right? This guy, this guy looks a little lonely, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he's off yes. and uh, he's just off living life on his own. I, I kind of, at least I had this idea when I saw this image, it's like there's the star off in the distance. So he knows in his depths that there is something greater within him. And he should be searching for it, but you can see how far off in the distance it is. He still has all of this road to travel, but uh, he's going through this hard process in life right now. And so he's still searching for that thing within himself, but you can see he's, he's exiled. He's out there. He's on his own. And so a lot of life can feel like that if you don't know how to get in touch with the greater self. So, and then here's another image to, to kind of reflect it. I mean, you can kind of see the skull image. It's this dark, it's gray. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, life feels meaningless at times. So being able to actually acknowledge that, a lot of people were told by society, you should be happy your whole life. And then you aren't happy. So you feel like I'm not going to tell anybody because I'm supposed to be happy. <laughs> and then uh, a lot of things within society are trying to get you away from the idea that part of life is suffering in a sense. And so life can go on continue to, to do that but you want to mask yourself every single day to try and make it seem like that's not happening but in order to actually be enlightened and get in touch with something higher than you you have to acknowledge that that evil side of life if you will you have to acknowledge that in your garden not only the good plants grow and you got to be willing to you know, life is work you got to till the garden you got and we'll, weeds. Exactly. <laughs> and we're gonna we'll get into that mr mr kane's coming up here this is where the this is where it gets it's gonna start heating up ladies and gentlemen
Yeah, so we keep talking about the collective ideas of man and how if you dive into all these ideas, you'll start to see things that everybody goes through. And so you have these stories that are archetypal. And so the Bible has a lot of them. So the Bible representations of the alienated ego. The Bible represents several mythological figures representing the state of alienation. Adam and Eve, one we've already dove into, are sad and estranged figures as they are expelled from the garden. Also, Cain is a figure of alienation. We read in Genesis. So this is from Genesis. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, for his part, brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Important note, he, uh, he had regard for Abel and his offering. And so, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and then his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you so, or why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? Just to inter uh, interject here real quick. Oh, so-and-so is successful. How, how come Johnny was fucking successful and I'm not successful? like i'm putting all this work in i'm working 40 hours a week i should be getting paid just as much as john how come he's how come johnny's making it and i'm not and just consider that as we continue to go why it doesn't matter the the overall and the overall encompassing power does not choose sides it's do we work with it or do we work against it are we the fish swimming upstream and oh, fuck i'm i'm working i'm working i'm not getting anywhere i'm working i'm working or do we utilize it with us? And let's look around the direction. And now we're swimming with the river instead of against the river. And we can travel so much farther, get so much results because nature's laws, they're gonna be present everywhere. In every religious text, they're gonna be in every mythological text that you can find. It's the same every single place that you go. So understand that it doesn't, it doesn't choose sides. The power is the power. We have to decide to work with it or work against it. And if we get in our own way, well, fuck, Johnny's successful and I'm not successful. Next thing you know, I, I tax too much into the ego, into the animal body, and I'm going to get pissed. Fuck, how come? I, I'm going to start picking on myself now. I'm going to put myself in the corner. Well, maybe I'm not good enough. Well, fuck everybody else then. And it, watch, watch what happens. Yeah, so here is uh, Cain and Abel giving their offerings to Yahweh, the Lord, um, several names. But uh, you can see in this image that they uh, are getting it up to the higher power. So. Cool. So Yahweh, Lord, aka, does not seem to realize that it was his own rejection of Cain and his offerings that has caused this whole trouble. So Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood in your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive, a fugitive and a wanderer of the earth or on the earth. So now with, 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 um, with uh, Cain, he's sitting there thinking. It's the same way with people. It's like, oh, so-and-so is successful, or I'm jealous of them. So now all of a sudden, people are looking on social media. What's the one negative thing I can find about this person I don't like? <laughs> you know what? Oh, you know what? You got ugly hair. And then you're going around all the friends. Yeah, she's cool, but fucking, she got some ugly hair, so fuck her. And it's, it's all out of jealousy. It's all out of, hey, let's go out into the field. So now people don't, especially in today's day and age, yes, there is still murder, there is still killing, but it's not so much, hey, let's go out into the field, I'm gonna take you out. It's how do I bring you down on a mental, emotional, and spiritual level because of technology, because of the internet. Now it's picking these guys apart and we're gonna talk about cleaning our own cup, but we're always looking to justify or rationalize our evil actions and thoughts. Look at here, he's like, uh, where's your brother, Abel? Or, uh, he said to Cain, where's your brother, Abel? And he said, I don't know. I'm not my brother's keeper. 
It's like, well, oh, something bad happened to them. Well, I don't care, even though you were the one that caused it because you started the rumor about how terrible this person was. Well, fuck, they should have been, maybe they had a bad experience and they were sad or something bad happened to them. And you're like, well, that's what they get for having the ugly hair. And at the end of the day, you were the one that were jealous of. It's like, how do we contain ourselves from the, why are we shifting the blame? How do we contain ourselves from justifying or rationalizing our evil? And it comes with facing that fear again. Why am I jealous of that person? Why do I feel that negative way? And most of the times, it's, I might be insecure for myself in a certain way. Or I don't like where I'm at, so I need to take it out on somebody else. It's the crabs in the bucket mentality. One crab starts elevating, all the other crabs are hurrying down the legs and pulling back down. Well, they're trying to get out too. And so how do we, it's not my fucking fault. It's not me. You know what? That's just how it is. That's just how life should be. We're always looking to, it's not my fault. We got to take responsibility. And we have to be able to find people in our group that'll say, hey, take responsibility. And it's humble pie. It always tastes shitty. But it's the most nutrient dense food you can ever get. <laughs> and if you have the right people around you, me, crew, and Demi talked about this the other day. It might not happen right now. Tendi might say something to me that's true, but I'm heightened emotionally and I'm angry. I'm not, I heard, I heard it. But I'm not gonna accept I'm not gonna accept it just yet. I gotta go take some me time and then take it in. All right, that's my brother. He thinks he wants the best for me. Now I can listen instead of just hear. Yeah. And even bring it up like a, a higher view if you just look at the, the general story and what happens is the greater self rejects the ego. And so he feels rejected and then he gets alienated. And because of that, he wants to take the anger out, anger out on the world. And so whether it's jealousy or just negative feelings in general it gets people want to put their pain out on others or they take all that pain and do it inward. So we'll dive into that a little bit more, but essentially the greater self within rejects the ego and then the ego feels all this despair, hate, and pain and they want to make everybody else feel that. Look at the, like the Columbine shooters and stuff like yeah, that. This um, mass mass murders. Yeah. They're feeling so terrible about their own world. Like I need everybody else to feel my pain too. It's so, so interesting. Ayn Rand has a money ass quote here. It says, you can ignore reality, but you can't ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. That's, that's, I can hide from it. It's like, you know what? I can be in my little box. I can go in my room. Let's say war is going on outside. I go into my room. There's no war. There's no war. There's no war. There's no war. I can ignore it as much as I want. I can create a movie that is not real as much as I want. But as soon as the, the soldiers come, boom, kick down my door, it's like, oh shit, I can't ignore the consequences because now they're here. And that fear will knock at your doorstep if you do not choose to face it first. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to point out a few main things to take away from this story because it is, of course, an archetypal. So Cain is banished to the wilderness reenacting on another level Adam's banishment from paradise. If we look at the myth objectively rather than traditionally, we see that the origin of the difficulty was God's, aka self, rejection of Cain without apparent cause or reason. So sometimes things happen in life and there's no apparent cause or reason to them. And this is once again, pulling it up as a layer higher, um, looking at it to see that it's essentially God rejecting the ego, which would in this case be Cain. And so Cain is an archetypal figure representing the experience of rejection and alienation. His reaction to, uh, to an excessive and irrational rejection is characteristic, namely violence. And so people will have this rejection. Um, they feel they, they've had, they have that inflated state. Things happen in their life. They break their worldview, but then they fester all that anger. They feel the despair, the hate, the pain in the world. And now they want to take that out on others. And if you look at just the whole 20th century overall, like you can look back and see there's been a lot more violence of people going into school, shooting them up and just things like that, bombings and things like that. So the, this whole apocalypse is happening in everybody's head, but a lot of that comes from not knowing their internal world. What's the next phase? What's the next, next part of this cycle that I go through? And that's why this is so important because if you don't know these type of things, you get stuck in that alienation phase and then you feel like the world is after you. And then because of that, you want to take all that anger out on the world, which is exactly what Cain did. And he just directed that towards somebody else. But even Cain, you have a Cain and you have an Abel in your own head. And so it could be Abel was killing part of himself internally. 
And so some people would direct that violence outside. Some people do it passive aggressively too. Um, a lot of people do it passive aggressively rather than being aggressive and actually being able to, to use their words. But uh, essentially people will take out all this pain on the world and it's because they don't know how the internal world and the psyche works. So they don't know what's next in the cycle that we go through. And then just to add to this, um, whenever one experiences an unbearable alienation and despair, it is followed by violence. The violence, violence can take either an external or an internal form. In extreme forms, this means either murder or suicide. So whether or not it's murder on the outside of you or on the inside of you, there's always gonna be some type of phase of violence, of hurting oneself and even this people cutting themselves and things like that. It is kind of a, a minor version of this, um, but you're taking pain out in some type of way and you don't wanna experience this pain. Nobody wants to experience the pain, but it's something you have to go through, so. 100%. 100%. So the, the crucial point from all of this is the root of violence of any form lies the experience of alienation, a rejection too severe to be endured. And so if you go back and you look on a lot of these phases of violence throughout all of society, you would find that it's, it's most likely somebody who felt alienated, not included in what society had to offer. Um, and I would say a lot of people probably feel a lot of these feelings nowadays. This was the way society is headed. People are cut out of certain groups certain ideas. And so people start to get this festered up feelings. So, And just here, it's as simple as this. People that are hurt, hurt people, hurt people. Did you make that quote? Um, I don't know who said it, but <laughs> I'm, I'm all claiming it. Wrong. And healed people, heal people. I'm working, I'm working with this kid. I'm working with this kid right now. And it broke my heart. He came up to me the other day and we're, talk, we're talking about wrestling. We're talking about, uh, basically just working working on the expanding the rest of them. We're also working on expanding confidence. And he, he come up to me and he said, man, well, well, I'm a little wimpy. And I looked at him and this is, a, this is a young man. He's just about to go through these changes where he's figuring out what a man even is. He says, well, I'm a little wimpy. And I says, you don't ever talk to yourself like that again in front of, in front of anybody. You're not wimpy. It's like, and why did he say I'm a little wimpy? Because somebody told him he was, and he accepted that. And that's heartbreaking. So, so somebody told him, so I had to break it down for him. I said, why do you think people are mean to each other? He's like, well, I don't know, maybe that's just who they are. They're mean, or they're, that's just how they grew up mean, and they're just angry, and they're mean. That's just, that's just the type of person they are. I said, no, have you guys ever experienced when you're thinking a thought, there's a little voice in your head? And it can tell you to be nice, it can tell you to be mean, it can tell you to solve a problem, it can tell you whatever you're looking for. Like, yeah, all the time. I said, if somebody is saying mean things to other people, what does that mean? And all it means is that that little voice in their head is saying mean things to them. Because they're hurting themselves internally, just like we talked about earlier. Instead of going and murder and suicide, that's the furthest extremes of the spectrum. But in, the, in between, it's those little thoughts, maybe I'm not good enough, you walk past me. Or, man, I don't like the way my nose looks. Whatever it may be, you start breaking yourself down. You start hurting yourself. And then what do you start doing? Now you start judging others. Oh, you know what? That girl is perfect because this. She might have been the kindest soul in the world, but now you looked at her because of a physical image or you, she had a, maybe she had one vice or something. Ah, she's, out of the, she's out of the equation. She's out of the equation because I start hurting myself. Now I can't look at the good in others. If I'm hurting myself, Instead of me looking at how great Denby is, I'm looking at, man, you know what? Denby only typed one shoe today. What is he doing? And I was like, <laughs> I'm, no, I'm getting pissed and picking out the little things of everybody because hurt people hurt people and healed people heal people. Mm -hmm. Cool. So all of these experiences tie into a lot of the, the religious experience. So diving into this, uh, there are numerous descriptions of religious experiences, which typically are preceded by what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul, what Kierkegaard called despair, and what Jung called defeat of the ego. All these terms refer to the same psychological state of alienation. We find again and again the documentation of religious experiences, a profound sense of depression, guilt, sin, 
unworthiness and the complete absence of any transpersonal support, a foundation for one's existence to rest upon. So this reflects a lot of what we've been talking about. Essentially, somebody is totally disconnected from God, if you will. Um, and so because of that, they feel the sense of depression, guilt, and unworthiness. And so if, if you dive into a lot of these stories, it's across several different myths that these things happen. And so once again, uh, it's really reflected a lot throughout the Bible. But, uh, go here. So here's one of them. This is Elijah in the wilderness getting fed by the ravens. You can see the background. It doesn't look like a fun place to be, but uh, this is where people are at in their internal world, right? So this is the image um, that reflects where people can be when they're in the state of alienation. And so the classic symbol for alienation is the image of wilderness, which is what we just looked at there. We have a few more here, but it is here characteristically that some manifestation of God is encountered. When the wanderer is lost in the desert and is about to perish, a source of divine nourishment appears. So in this state of alienation, you're actually in the desert of yourself and you're actually going through these things. You're going through a hard place in life and then something will happen, which is part of that same sidekick cycle that we've been talking about. You start to become humble and you start to open yourself up to the greater self within. But the issue is that there's not a lot of things that will teach you nowadays that there is something next in the phase and that you have this internal world. So a lot of people just think that they're a brain and that's it. <laughs> you just have all these rational thoughts and there's not anything greater outside of yourself. They don't even think there is an unconscious or a greater self within. And so they don't open themselves up to any of those ideas. So they stay in the desert rather than uh, getting that divine nourishment that appears in all these archetypal stories. Something comes along after you've been wandering for so long. You're that guy that's uh, in the ravine earlier and he sees the greater self off in the distance, but he keeps going, keeps going. And then, you know, to the point that he's about to die, something greater comes along. But that's also the death of your old self. And that old self dies and you open yourself up to become something new. But in order to become something new, you have to burn yourself into some ashes. Um, that same idea of dismemberment is just a, a word that was up there a little bit higher. You have to take yourself apart and figure out what is it that went wrong, that what was so wrong about the state of inflation that I was in. And then you start to actually observe all of that and then you can become something new. But the idea is you burn yourself into ashes and that's the idea of the phoenix, rise something to, anew. But you have to go to the point of death and then something else comes. So. One of my favorite... Uh philosophers in the Stoic philosophy of Seneca. And basically he gets banished from his town. And that was that was almost worse than death to most people. He gets banished. And so he's on this island, he's banished all by himself. And at the beginning he's like, oh fuck, you know, this is a terrible island. I don't want to be here. This is a terrible place. What's going on? And then after a while, he's in so he's literally in that wilderness. After a while he starts seeing these animals on the island, these bugs on the island. And it's like this is those creatures' home. And it's like, if they are happy here and they can adapt to live here and enjoy living here, that's their home, why can't I? And it comes from just a mental perspective shift from going into the wilderness, unknown, scary, fearful, to, oh, this is something that I do know. These, these creatures are doing what I need to be doing. Let's follow the law. Let's be the fish swimming with the river instead of the fish swimming against the river. So, <clears throat> so this is something else. Uh, Exodus is basically when all the uh, Israelites, they weren't Israelites yet. But essentially, uh, they're traveling through the desert with Moses, and then manna comes from heaven. They think they're all about to die. And then uh, God comes in clutch for them, sends them down some food, and he's like, you're good. But this was to the point that the whole collective thought they were about to die in the desert. So. Some spirit food. Fuck, I'm in banishment. I'm going to die out here. You know, what, what am I doing? This, oh, here's my spirit food. These other creatures, these other animals, these other beings on this island, they can do it. If they can do it, I can do it. Get that mental perspective shift. Yep, and this is uh, another one. St. Paul and St. Anthony out in the wilderness getting fed by a raven. Once again, symbolic of things will come if you keep searching. It's the same idea as knock and you'll find them. So. And so the, the psychological meaning between all of this um, from a high level is 
the experience of supporting aspect of the archetypal psyche is most likely to occur when the ego has exhausted its resources and is aware of its essential impotence by itself. So the ego is going through life, they think they have it all handled, and then you've exhausted all these things that are within your ego and they are just not working. And so you have to pull something from the greater self within if you are to move on, but you almost exhaust yourself once again. It's like you're in that desert, you're about to die. But uh, it's gonna have this quick note. Yeah. But uh, basically it's becoming subordinate to the greater self within. You start to realize that there is the, the greater self there um, within your psyche and then you, you are the one serving it rather than thinking you're the one in control all the time. Fuck, I can't do it by myself. I want to be the guy. I want to be the guy to put it all the way on my shoulders and carry the team. That shit gets heavy. I can't do it by myself. You got to have a team. You got to have Big G helping you out. And check out this quote right here. This is from the, the Bible as well. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. It says, come to me. All you who labor and are heavily burdened, man, what are you going through? Don't carry all the weight on your back. It's going to crumble. The earth and the, the, the situations we go through as humans. And it says here, it says, and I will give you rest. He's going to take that weight off your shoulders, the big G, if you allow him to. And call the big G whatever you want to call it. But it's that one power that you can, again, realize, fuck, I can't do it by myself. This shit's too heavy. Take my yoke upon you. So you guys know what a yoke is? If you guys see two oxen, like they're pulling a wagon or pulling a, a plow, they have these things around their neck and their shoulders. It's, it's like their backpack that they're pulling. That's the yoke. Give the weight. And he says, take my yoke. Here, let me give you mine. Let's turn the river back with us. Let's flow with the river as the fish. And now it's going to be, oh, that's a gentle river. And it's a humble river. It's not blasting us in the face all day because we're trying to swim upstream. No, now we're swimming with it. And it's light and it's smooth and it's gentle and it's ease and it's flow instead of force. And you have to be able to balance both. And it says, and you, oh, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Light in two terms light in illumination as well as light and weight. Mm. And then another one, um, this is us. Fuck, this is the responsibility we don't want to take, you know. It says, you blind Pharisee. So basically he's like, what the hell's going on? How come so and so is bad? How come I'm judging again? I'm judging everybody else. And it says, you, you blind Pharisee. Basically, you fool. Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter that the outside of them may be clean too. As soon as I clean myself up, my negative thoughts that are beating down on me, Instead of me worrying about Demi tying his one shoe with the, it's like, now I can be, oh, Demi's a great guy. Look at all the people he's serving. Because I'm beating myself up. As soon as I clean my own thoughts up, my thoughts about everybody else will change. And guess what will change? With my thoughts changing, how people act towards me and the results I get will also change. Because thoughts are things, ladies and gentlemen. Quantum physics. So, definitely a, a lot here. Um, but uh, where you have, or where have you hit healing? Oh, this is you. Oh, you sorry. This. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, this is, I like, I don't so let's go. We want to we wanna really ask our, and I'm only going to be sharing this story because we all need to um, go internal and ask, where have we been alienated? Where have we been depressed? Where have we been hopeless? Where have we been like, oh, shit. I can't do it by myself. I need something else, something bigger. So, so where have you hit alienation in your own life? What brick wall did you run into over and over again until you realized that you had to give it to a higher power than your own selfish desires? Or what viewpoint of the world that you wanted to hold on to? Man, I want to live in my fucking fantasy land. There's war outside my room, but I don't want to acknowledge it. I, I can either prepare and get ready for the war, or I can be like, oh shit, and then they kick, boom, kick my door in, and it's here. Dear, dear in the headlines, right? You don't know what to do. So suicidal thoughts, um, this was crazy. And I don't talk about this a ton, but people need to understand the story. So growing up, every time I, this is the alienation, this is where the world changes and, and everything I should to be able to create a new perspective. My whole life growing up, my best was always good enough. Anytime I've given 100% into anything I want, every single time. So all of a sudden, um, I get blessed with a child. 
It was unexpected, absolutely, but I got completely blessed and I had never been loyal to a female. So I said, you know what? I want to give you 100% loyalty. I've never given it. And I want to, let's see if we can fix things and get things where we can on the right path. And so things continued, things continued. Um, but I was lying to myself because I was finding fulfillment in the animal mind only instead of the spiritual mind. So I had things going on um, where I was, I was living for everybody else outside. I was living for somebody else. That 100% was to please somebody else instead of to be the best me and add unto others and add into that relationship. So because I was stuck in uh, living from the outside in, what the world told me I needed to be, oh, well, this person isn't happy. You need to do this. Instead of what my gut told me I needed to do, I listened to what the world said. And it fucking destroyed me. I saw so just to, just to bounce back into uh, living in the animal mind. I got introduced to pornography at a very, very young age. And um, during this time in my life, because I had never been completely loyal to a female, I was getting deep into this. If I couldn't have it in real life, I could be, I could be loyal in real life. But in my imaginary world, when I go online and I see these videos, I can still get that fulfillment of the disloyalty. Correct. And so this continued to skew my lens and change the color of the glasses that I was looking through. And so my, we were getting fulfillment in the physical areas, but nowhere else. So we fight, 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 boom, physical. And then I'm not even there though. I'm in a movie that I saw on the internet instead of physical there. Does that make sense? And so it started to continue to break the chains. And I'm like, what's going on? Everything else, I'm trying to bend over backwards. I'm trying to give 100% into this area. And it's not good enough. What's happening? What's happening? And now I'm starting to lose control. And it's terrifying. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, it's freaking out. And so next thing you know, things aren't going in the direction I want them to. Well, how come? Well, why am I even here if I can't get what I want out of my best? And then it's like, then you lose sight of your vision. You lose sight of who you are inside, and you're trying to gain that goal. And we'll talk about this. A man without a vision shall perish. As soon as you lose sight of your vision, now it's like, I have nothing to live for. Because honestly, guys, I thought I was going to go wrestle in college, and now I'm, this is in quotations on purpose, forced. Obviously, it was a blessing and op to have the opportunity to take a different path. But I'm thinking, man, this isn't where I want to be. This isn't who I am. My whole life changed, and then I didn't get what I want, and then I tried to change myself, and I didn't get what I want again. And I was like, who the fuck even am I? Do, and am I even powerful? Do I have that power? Should I be here? So where have we been in our lives? And it, it might be a situation similar, it may be completely different, but we've all been alienated in that despair, in that hopelessness, and to be able to rise again, like you said, from the ashes. But a man without a dream is dead. As soon as you start losing sight of your vision and you start living for everybody else externally, instead of living internally out, then we're dead. We are no longer living between the spirit and the animal. We're just stuck in one side. And now we're trapped. And we got to come alive, guys. We have to get a dream. There it is. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And you have to see from the mind's eye, not be exteriorized, because this shit's an illusion. It's like, oh, nothing's going well for me, or something bad's happening, or and now I can focus on all the bullshit. Or, you know what? I got to get, a, I gotta get some, a surgery because I want to look like so-and-so instead of how do I build the best version of me up? I don't want to look like somebody else. I want to look like me, the best me. And for those who ask for sight, it will be given. And we have to understand that we're brought into an evil and tough world, guys. That's not sunshine and rainbows. Like he said at the beginning of life, you're getting told all the great things. You're getting seen all the movies. You're like, man, everything's so great. Everything's awesome. This shit's incredible. And then challenges start happening. Oh, shit, what is going on? Next thing you know, um, you're, you're trapped there. And again, the self or the big G doesn't always take sides. It creates the laws. It creates the river flowing. It doesn't care if you choose to try to swim up the river or you try to choose, uh, swim down the river. It wants you to flow with the river downstream. But if, fuck, if you're determined to go upstream and swim up the river, so be my guest. And that's free will right there. That's the difference between a human and an animal. Uh, because we get to choose instead of completely live by natural instinct. So creating a love for big G or a hatred in the, or disbelief in the big G is what happens depending on what side of the river we're going up against. 
if we're swimming the river upstream, I know this is fucking hard, life isn't fun, and I'm getting into dark places, what's going on? And then after that, if we switch the side of the river, we're like, oh, it's been working for me the whole time. I've been working against me. It's been me. That's, that's, that's the humble pie that's so nutrient dense, but tastes terrible, but the body needs it, right? <laughs> Man, it gets crazy. Um, especially if we view our work and efforts as not good enough. If we're looking on the external and uh, let's say you're working for your grandma and your grandma said, well, that wasn't good enough. Maybe that's just how she was taught her whole life. That's how she thinks about herself. And then you believe it. That's Maybe I'm not good enough. Now you just dealt that hatred, that disbelief. And that anger, which eventually turns into violence or extreme sides of killing outside or killing inside, right? One of my favorite Egyptian photos right here. All these headless people, right? Walking around. To those who ask for sight, it will be given, guys. But you got to ask. There's the big G up here saying, hey, I got the wisdom. I'll show you how to flip around as a fish and flow with the river instead of against the river. Do you want to see it or do you not want to see it? I'm not ready to see it. Yet. I'm pretty pissed off right now, Big G. I can't do it. I'm going through this. As soon as you're ready to see it, hey, give me some fucking wisdom. Give me some sight. Hey, he's got he's got unlimited eyeballs for you. Bang. Here you go. Bang. Here you go. Hey, hey that Rocky always says, listen to the OGs. Exactly. You listen to the ones that before have given us the wisdom and stuff. But a lot of times we don't we don't accept our blessings because we we're too proud to not listen listen to it. Always listen to the OGs, listen to the big Gs. So. Yep, truly. And he's the OG of OGs. Exactly. Yeah. Big G, big G. Yep, <laughs> big G, the OG. <laughs> yeah, so uh, restitution of the ego self axis. So really to summarize a lot of these things is in order to break out of the alienated state, some contact between the ego and self must be reestablished. If this can happen, a whole new world opens. And really a lot of that is uh, a lot of things that can drag somebody out of this area is getting in touch with these psychological ideas because if somebody in their ego is aware that there's all these archetypal stories and things that represent somebody going through the same thing that they've gone through internally, that's when they can actually start to open themselves up to a new world. Some people can just do it naturally and they will do it naturally, but a lot of our world is missing a myth to live by. And so a lot of people used to be able to live by things like Christianity but because of science and all these other things, it's really started to make the mind work a lot differently. And so they don't have these archetypal ideas that drag somebody out of despair. And so a whole new world can open up if you start to get familiar with these stories and start to know what is the next phase that comes after where I am. And you start to relay yourself to the greater self of the unconscious within. And if this never happens, we continue to remain in a world with alienation glass with the alienation glasses on. We stay in the world of despair. Man, you know, life isn't good. You wake up and you're focused on 10 of the negative things instead of the one great thing you could be focused on. Um, and as soon as we see the lenses through darkness instead of light, we're stuck. But like TK was mentioning earlier, a phoenix rises from the ashes. It has to completely disintegrate. You have to shake up and break down everything you've ever learned to be able to relearn. And there was a, I don't even know what martial artist it was, it might have been Bruce Lee, but somebody came up to this great martial artist and said, hey, uh, can I learn from you? And the martial artist said, no. Well, the guy's like, the student's like, well, fuck, how come? I want to learn from you. And he says, because you know too much of what you know. If you want to learn what I know, you got to unlearn everything you know. You got to make capacity on the bookshelves for me to show you what I know. But is, are we humble enough to be able to do that? And if so, we'll be able to burn the old self down and rise anew from the ashes. And, a and all that is is a perspective shift. That's it, it's just a thought shift. And at the time, like I told you guys when I was in that dark spot, I didn't know how to get that thought shift. So I had to do it with um, substances. So not fully understanding my psychology, a medical cannabis assisted in this per per ah, perspective shift. But now my mind is trained to shift perspectives completely sober through mental techniques and internal questions. There's, there's so much use and so much benefits of um, medicinal cannabis, but it's not for everybody. And it should be used um, not as a escape, but as a tool. So being able to have tools that way that you can automatically chemically induce, or even better, being controlling yourself enough to be able to 
make that chemical shift in the brain and make that perspective thought change just being you. And as soon as you get to that power, you can go and grow so fast it is sick. You can become the most elite version of yourself faster than you even could imagine. But it all starts with believing in yourself that you can. Yeah, so this is uh, also kind of archetypal um, from King David within the Bible. He has some things. He has. He basically wants to sleep with somebody else's wife, so he sends this guy off to war. He dies, and then Nathan is the prophet. So he Nathan is basically the guy who can speak to God because da King David back in the Old Testament, you can't actually talk directly to God. You didn't have the Holy Spirit within you. Um, but this guy goes talks to God. God comes back to David. He's like, "Listen, I know what you did." <laughs> and uh, King David's like, "Oh shit." He's like, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so so uh, you can see he's kind of dwelling on all that here. But you come to this spot where you have to repent, right? God, I mean, these things within you, the self knows what you did and what you didn't do. So you get to the point when you've been in this alienated state that you have to repent for what has been done. You get to the point where you do have to, be, have to become humble and accept the path that you did choose to go down. And so because of that, that's when you can start to become something new. But until you're willing to accept all those things that are within that maybe aren't what you want within your personality, you can't actually shift. And so a lot of this, uh, if you guys have heard um, the shadow, you're observing those things that are within the shadow of your personality. So those things that don't have light on them that you've chosen not to look at, a lot of this is coming into acceptance with that. And this is that process, right? God comes to you in some type of fashion the self comes to you sending signals, maybe it's through dreams or just your thoughts, or your ideas, and then you have to repent for it. But a lot of people don't want to go through the humbling process. And there's very few things in our society that teach us to become humble. <laughs> so uh, it's, some, uh, it's a place that you have to arrive to by yourself. Just to interject on this photo real fast, King David probably doesn't want to fucking hear it from me. You know, so taking into consideration, it might come through a dream. It might come from your enemy telling you something that you didn't want to hear. And because he's your enemy, like, ah, no funny listening to that. That's garbage. Or, um, for example, I've listened to a lot of speeches and a lot of speakers, a lot of psychologists, a lot of different people. Some of them I relate with more than others. And it's like, I can either focus on that speaker, but you know what, I don't like this guy. So his message is just, it's, it's null, it's void. It doesn't mean anything. Or... Maybe that message, the big G is trying to give you the message, but are you humble enough to accept it from wherever it comes from, especially the places we don't like? Yeah, and then this is also just a different image of the same idea. It gets to the point, Nathan comes to him. Um, he's had these hard things happen in his life. He did some wrongdoing. He was inflated, so he's like, I'm gonna go have this guy get killed. <laughs> and uh, then he does get to sleep with the wife and everything. But then, you know, all that comes, the reckoning comes, and he has to get to the point where he's humble and accepts the consequences for it. But he's observed himself, the things he's done, and now he can start to become a new person. And that's the story that a lot of us all go through. You had something, you did something wrong, you have to choose to, to look at it. You may not want to look at it for a while, so these things linger for a couple of months. But then you get to the point where you do become humble and accept it then you can actually become somebody new. You can start to fix that personality to the way that you want to be. And so it can fit more of the reality that's outside of you rather than the fake story that you told yourself to rationalize why you did the things you did. So really a high level overview is even for the normal man, alienation is a necessary experience. If so, uh, psychological development is to proceed because ego self identity is as universal as original sin. So you don't want to be in this spot where you're living very unconsciously of the things you do. And you may go through this process and become more aware of the things you've been doing. You become more conscious, but you still are in the Garden of Eden in certain other areas. And so this is a process you continue to go down, but you don't want to be getting ran by yourself. You don't want to be up on the stage of this movie that you're living and just the self is telling you every single thing to do and you're just doing it unconsciously. You wanna be able to relay and collaborate with the self within. And so this is getting at the point that uh, they are identical. The ego self identity is as universal as the original sin. But it is through alienation that we seek the greater self within. So we go through this, going back to that idea, you're stuck in the desert, feels like you're about to die and then something greater comes along. 
And then through this seeking, we find what was always there, but was in the darkness of our depths. And so you have to go through these hard things in order so that you can get to the good things. It's the same idea as Jesus going down into hell after he was on the cross. Some text wouldn't say that, but uh, there's other texts that get at the point that when he was crucified, he went through all these hard things in life. Then he descends down into hell. He has to face all the demons. And so the same thing happens within ourselves. We go through these hard things. We get crucified in some type of way in life. And then we go down into hell. We have to face all these things. And it's only after that that you get to ascend back up higher. But you're just living life like this rather than being able to go down here, observe all this hard shit, the things that are in your shadow, and then you get to ascend up into heaven. But you're not getting in touch with transpersonal powers until you choose to look at the hard things in life. But sometimes you're in hell for a while, so you have to observe all those things. It takes time. So, yeah. The last words of Jesus before he dies on the cross is, God, why have thou forsaken me? He's going through immense pain, immense pain. He gave up on me. Why have you done this to me? And you go through it and boom, he ascends. The tallest skyscrapers have to have the deepest foundations. You have to be able to dig the deepest foundations in order to ascend to the highest levels. Um, and like he said, the normal man, alienation is necessary experience. But if I go through life and I'm doing all my actions and I'm living on the stage instead of being also working with the director, all of a sudden I'm a creature of circumstance. I'm going through life thinking, well, luck happened. You know what? He got the girl that he wanted, but I can't because I'm, I'm, I'm this or I make up some fucking bullshit story of why I can't have it, why I can't have the female that I want or why I can't get the results that I want. Now I'm a creature of circumstance. Naive men or naive humans, I should say, naive humans believe in luck. Wise and understanding men and humans believe in cause and effect. Take that into consideration. We're the creators of circumstance, not the creatures of circumstance. That's all I got for us today, ladies and gentlemen. Does anybody have anything to add before we stop the recording? That fish swimming yeah. up that river. Yes, sir. Well, mom and dad got to swim up that river. Yes. Great lives. Truly, yeah, yeah. yes, <laughs> that's a new just like that. Yeah, that's exactly right, though. And you have to be able to go through that work to get back down, get to the flow. And don't be afraid to go into the garden and fucking till the weeds. It takes work, it's not fun. You know more than anybody. This is a farming, this is you got any farming questions this year, guys. <laughs> But it, it's so real. Don't be afraid of the work it takes to be the creator of circumstance. Yeah. Or you can just live your whole life fucking drifting. Well, this happened because of this. I just have the bad luck. This is just my life. This is how it should be. And we get trapped. Be the creators. Right. But and then like what, what you said, Darren, it's like there, um, yeah, there's a struggle of swim, swimming upstream to repopulate, you know, for something that with like great purpose. You know, there's a difference between that and then just toiling, just sitting, just sitting in the downstream or sitting, swimming upstream, just, just toiling for the sake of it. Like, oh, back in life again. Right. This is how it is. Living the dream. There goes Chet, dickhead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Truly. Beautiful, beautiful point. Thank you. Any last words? Last thoughts? All right. We'll stop the recording there. Let's see. Woo! <laughs>